Second reading is from the book of Numbers, chapter 22, verses 21 through 39. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, she turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat her to get her back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between two vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat her again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat her with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, What have, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. The angel of the Lord asked him, why have you beaten your donkey these three times? I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now, but I would have spared her. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the array of the road to oppose me. Now, if you are displeased, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. When Balak heard that Balaam was coming, he went out to meet him at the Boabite town of Arnon, bar quarter at the edge of the territory. Balak said to Balaam, Did I not send you an urgent summons? Why did you come to me? Am I really not able to reward you? Well, I have come to you now, Balaam replied, but I can say just anything. I must speak only what God puts in my mouth. Then Balaam went with Balak to Kirah Huzzah. Balak sacrificed cattle and sheep and gave some to Balaam and the princes that were with him. Amen. <laughs> bless the reading of his word today. So we are uh, looking at a passage maybe you've not heard preached before. I don't know. But uh, how many of you have a favorite scripture passage? Does anybody have like a favorite and it's like one you always kind of turn to? Some people um, turn to John 3.16, for God so loved the world. That's a pretty popular one. Some people... Um, Focus on Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. Some people look at Jeremiah 2911, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope in a the future. There's others who focus on Romans 8, 38 through 39, which says those words, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those are all great choices. Maybe you have one that I didn't mention, but uh, I wanted to focus on one that I hadn't ever preached upon before, and I got the idea from a dear, sweet friend of mine who passed a couple of years ago, and this was her favorite passage. And if you knew this woman, you know that she loved to smile and to laugh. And I think this is a pretty funny passage. And at the same time, it's very profound. And so 
I've chosen to, um, to speak on the story of Balaam here in Numbers chapter 22. Balaam lived at the time that Moses was leading the Israelites through the desert, um, and he led them into the plains of Moab, to be exact, uh, before, uh, as they were waiting to enter the promised land, and Balaam was a prophet. Another word you might use to describe him would be a diviner or a soothsayer. And Balak, uh, Balak was the king of Moab um, in that territory, and he's very alarmed because he's sitting there in his, uh, his palace, and he's looking out, and he's seeing all of these Israelites flowing into his territory. Um, and the Israelites, he had heard, had already defeated two kings, so now they're like right on his doorstep, and he is understandably freaking out about it. Um, he says, they're pouring in, covering the whole land. They've set up camp right next to me. And so he, he reaches out to Balaam, the prophet, and he says, I need you to come here, and I need you to curse these people for me so that I don't get defeated by them too. Maybe I can defeat them before they defeat me. And so uh, the, the, the people, the messengers that gave Balaam, the prophet, this, this message, um, he sends them back to the king and says, tell him that I say, uh, I can only do what God commands me to do. Um, and in fact, in a dream prior to that discussion he had with his, uh, his people, his messengers, uh, God had told him in a dream, uh, don't curse these people, they're blessed. So, so after the messengers returned and, and told uh, King Balak the bad news, the king sent some high-ranking officials this time with essentially a blank check and, uh, to again try to persuade Balaam to reconsider and to come and help him out. Um, and, and so Balaam continues, then uh, he's hearing them, and now he's seeing all kinds of riches before him. So he said, he, 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 he uh, continues then to press God into allowing him to go and, and help the king out. Um, and God relents, and he says, if, if, they, if they come calling for you the next morning, then, then you can go. But again, only say what I command you to say. Um, and some people are kind of confused in this story because uh, Balaam then saddles up his donkey and he goes, uh, but it says that, you know, God's mad at him. And, and so that's, that's been the, the, the discussion of many theologians over the centuries is if God's allowing him to go, why is God also mad when he goes? Um, um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's more about the manner in which he goes and, and maybe what he didn't do when he, when he went. So that's what we'll talk about a little bit today. Um, but, but Balaam saddles up his donkey. He heads out back, uh, back towards King Balak and, and the Moabite officials. And that's when it happens. The donkey that he's riding looks up and he sees an angel of the Lord standing there with his sword drawn. The angel is only seen by the donkey. And so the donkey sees that and understandably turns off the path into the neighboring field. And that upsets Balaam who's riding the donkey. And so he starts striking him with his staff, which you can see there on the screen, a painting by Rembrandt, by the way, uh, of Balaam beating his poor donkey. And they go on, as you heard read, they go down the path a little bit further, and it, it, it narrows as it's going through a vineyard. There's walls on both sides, so it's an even tighter squeeze now as they're going along when the angel of the Lord appears again. And this time, the donkey sees him and gets as close to the wall as he's able to get around the angel, and when he does that, he crushes Balaam's foot against the wall, and so Balaam beats the poor donkey again. And then further on ahead, the angel of the Lord appears again in a spot where there is no going by him, and that's when the donkey does the only thing she's able to do, and she falls face down before the angel and, and lays right down on the ground, right under Balaam, who's riding her. And this enrages Balaam, and he again begins beating the poor donkey, and that's when, uh, I don't know if this is the most humorous miracle or not, but it's definitely funny, I think, if you think about a donkey talking. <laughs> but that's when it happens. The Lord opens the donkey's mouth, and, and the donkey speaks to Balaam and says, what have I done to make you beat me these three times? And the most amazing part to me is that Balaam uh, doesn't shriek and run away like I would do if I... 
But instead, and maybe it's because he's a prophet of God, who knows how God's spoken to him in the past, but he answers and he says, uh, you've made a fool of me. You know? uh, and if I had my sword ready to go, I would cut you down with it right now. And then the donkey speaks a little more. The Lord opens Balaam's eyes and finally he sees what the donkey had seen. And he does the same thing the donkey does. He falls face down before the angel of the Lord. And then the angel spoke. Why have you beaten your poor donkey this way? Why didn't you see that I am here to oppose you? Because you're running off recklessly into this situation. And you're running into this whole thing, ready to take the money that's offered you without listening carefully to what God is trying to tell you. And there's a bit more beyond that. I would encourage you to read the whole story of Balaam. Uh, but we'll stop right there to consider for a moment. Um, as God has something to say to Balaam, clearly, what might God have to say to you and me today? This seems to be a message of spiritual discernment. And, and, and spiritual discernment is, is trying to determine what God might be saying to us. And, and what is pointed out to us here, and what I think is a delightfully humorous way, is that this donkey had better spiritual dis discernment than Balaam did. Um, you know, the donkey could see what God wanted to happen. And Balaam was the prophet. Balaam's the one that could see into the future and all that sort of thing. He, he couldn't see the angel of the Lord standing right in front of him. He couldn't see that God was already angry at him when he set out that day. Um, because he didn't listen. And he ran off recklessly into this situation. Um, one thing we need to remember if we're going to uh, as, as Balaam said, if we're going to speak only what God tells us to speak, I think it's pretty safe to say that that requires that we be listening very, very closely and intently. And that brings me to my own reflections this morning a little bit, and, and I encourage you to reflect on yourself a little bit too as I do this. Uh, I think about my own situations in my life when I have tried to discern what God was, was saying to me and what God was maybe, maybe leading me to do and what His will for me is and how I might be obedient to Him. And like Balaam, I confess that there were times when I'm pretty sure that God was pretty specifically wanting me to do something and I failed to do it. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you found yourself maybe in a conversation that you were having with someone and you felt that nudge inside to say something. I don't know if it was to relate to them in some way. Maybe it was to mention Jesus in some way and you didn't and you walked away and you felt rotten from it. I think about things like that. And when did I, when, when did I like Balaam, make God angry by, by, by acting recklessly, by jumping into something uh, without consulting him first, you know, and, and, and really thinking about how he might have me go about that. Were there times like Balaam when I should have just cooled my jets and maybe spent a night or more waiting and discerning what he might have to say to me before I got up and ran into whatever it was that I ran into? How about you? Can you think about times when you've done what I've done? You failed to listen to God and do what He was telling you. I, I, I have, maybe you assumed to know, and, and you figured that you were doing the right thing at the right time, and it turned out that you weren't. Um, do you too have a past that's peppered with times when you've acted recklessly and you jumped in to something without so much as a thought about what God might have? Another thing that I consider as I read this passage today were, was, were there times when God tried to get my attention in a much gentler way than, than how he ended up getting my attention because I wasn't listening? Um, 
And so he sort of resorted to more extreme ways of getting my attention. And like I haven't had him resort to talking to me through a donkey, but, but I really feel like there were times in my life when he did turn to some more extreme measures to jog my uh, attention. And it was simply because I hadn't listened earlier. Uh, and, and, and one very specific story that I want to tell you, and some of you know this story because you were here for it, but it happened back uh, in, in the early parts of 2015. And I was just pastoring this church at that time as a part-time pastor, but we were already worshiping in the 80s at that point. And, and I was still working nearly full-time as an art director um, at a mail-order catalog company, handling their advertising and designing their catalog and product design and all this sort of stuff. And even in, the, in that time in my life, and for some time leading up to this fateful event in 2015, I had been sensing that God was calling me deeper into pastoral ministry. And I didn't do it because I was comfortable. Um, and, and I enjoyed the people that I worked with. I, and, and, and they're still family to me to this day. And I was good at my job and it allowed me to be creative, which I am a creative person and I need that in my life. And, and, and for the most part, I, I liked what I did most of the time in my vocation other than ministry. And, and um, I, I was as high as I could go in that company in my field. I had earned an, an, an art degree, a bachelor's of graphic design degree, and I was using it. I was an art director. I had made it, if you will. But I was also incredibly stressed because when you're an art director or a designer or whatever working for a company, there are deadlines all the time. And I was the only person in our art department. And as, as comfortable as I was, my greatest fulfillment wasn't at that job. It was in ministry. But there was more to do all the time. And I didn't have the time that I needed to help this church continue to grow and make a difference in people's lives and in the community. Even as I heard God calling me deeper into ministry. And, and um, I was stressed out that I was comfortable. I think about that story about, you know, a frog will sit in a pot of boiling water as it's just, it's warmer and warmer, and it gets used to it. So I guess I was used to stressing myself out. There was a certain comfort, comfort level to it. But anyways, February 2015 rolled around, and I can still remember some of what I was doing that week. Um, I had a catalog, catalog deadline approaching, and, 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 and I was behind the eight ball, and I was working 12, 13, 14 hour days, something like that. I was still trying to go uh, to the middle school and watch my daughter's basketball games. The Sunday prior to that week, um, I preached here in the morning at Clement. In the afternoon, I went over to North Webster UMC. I preached again. I led worship there for their um, upwards basketball closing program. Um, I raced back to Clement for the evening service. We had just started the fall before. Um, I went through the week, as I said, working you know till midnight or thereafter. Um, and, and I was going along until a Thursday night, and I passed out. And here's where you're welcome to laugh. I passed out Elvis fashion while sitting on a toilet. <laughs> it's okay. It's funny now. <laughs> but I sat down, and I felt really sick, and I wasn't sure, you know, how that is, and you don't really know which end's going to happen. <laughs> but I passed out. I remember I woke up lying on the floor. And uh, I never passed out like that before. My wife's standing over me holding a phone. And um, my, my daughter's standing there looking scared. I very reluctantly let her take me to the ER where I passed out again. Um, that landed me in an overnight stay at a hospital where the next day they were threatening to keep me another night. And the doctors determined um, that I just had a physical breakdown. I was trying to do too much. Um, and so then I took a week and recuperated. I missed my catalog deadline. The catalog went to, to press late. Somebody else had to preach in my place that, that, at, at church that Sunday. My church people came to my house and forbid me from trying to go back and preach. And in the midst of it, my wife sat me down and in no uncertain terms told me that she was not going to watch me kill myself. 
and that she too knew that God was calling me into full-time ministry, and I had a decision to make, and it was either I give some give up the art director thing or the ministry thing, but that I could not do both. And uh, that's when I finally listened, and, and I went into full-time pastoral ministry, and um, I finally listened to God. And all these years later, ever since, every once in a while I get to thinking about how I'm pretty sure God was trying to t get my attention in much gentler ways, you know, for those years when I could sense that nudging in my heart that he was calling me deeper into ministry and I kept putting him at bay and he didn't use a talking donkey, but he talked to me all right and it was through my body that couldn't do it all. And it finally reached its limits and it crashed. And I finally realized that I needed to change my life. And so I listened to God. And it wasn't his fault that I he had her talk to me in this very drastic and expensive way <laughs> to get my attention. That was my fault. That was my fault. And so I think about my own times in the past when God was trying to get my attention. I think about what he might be trying to tell me now. And so I invite you to consider the same. How God may have tried to get your attention in the past. And then I invite you to consider now, as I am for myself, what might God be trying to tell you? Today? Is there something that God is trying to tell you about your situation in your life, about maybe your relationships or your vocation? Is there something inside of you? Is that that nudge? I like to call it a nudge, you know. Is there a nudge inside of you that you can't quite put your finger on, but you sense that you're supposed to do something or start something or go somewhere or talk to somebody or consider some change in your life? Is there something that God might be compelling you to say or do or rethink or reconsider? And can you look back and count the number of times when you were led towards something to think about it and go to it and go into it? And could it be that God was speaking to you in that moment or in those moments, trying to get your attention? Take it for me Sometimes you can be pretty happy at what you're doing and where you are in your life, but God has something far better waiting for you. I mean, that's how I landed here again to before that. I was happy in my appointment prior to coming here. But my goodness, I wouldn't give this up for anything. God has something even better sometimes in store for us if we listen to him and we move with him. Him. And then secondly, what will you do with what God is trying to tell you? You've got some options, and I've personally done them all. Number one, you can listen and ignore what God is trying to tell you. Number two, you can listen to Him, but drag your feet and continue to put off what God is trying to tell you. Or number three, you can listen and you can respond to it in an appropriate and timely manner. I've done all three. The first two did not go well. <laughs> the second one was the one that landed me in the hospital, obviously, and, and, and uh, I completely avoided the third option. I could have avoided that had I went with option number three. The choice is yours and the choice is mine. And I do think that we have to be discerning and attentive, and that requires some work. You know, that requires some prayer and some time. But don't waste the time putting something off. Use that time to discern and to think and to pray and consider. So can I pray for us all in this, that we all might listen and discern and respond in such a way that God doesn't have to resort to talking donkeys or stays in the hospital to get our attention. Dear God who speaks, we look for your word to us in the pages of your scriptures and in the mouths of those whom we love and trust and in your creation all around us. May we constantly listen for your still, small voice. 
Lord, we acknowledge those times when you tried to get our attention and we ignored you. We also acknowledge those times when we did hear you speak to us, but we dragged our feet. And for all these times, we ask to you to forgive us. And Lord, when you speak, however you speak, help us to respond, to hear you, and discern and respond how you desire us to. Keep speaking to us, O oh Lord. Your servants are listening. And it's in the name of your word made flesh and in the name of Jesus we pray.